Hello and a very warm welcome to our online service today. We're delighted you can join us today in worshipping our risen Saviour. Today is Workplace Sunday, a special Sunday here at All Souls Church. Throughout the service today, we'll consider how our everyday work is part of God's purposes for His world and we'll reflect on how we can follow Christ in all that we do. As we direct our hearts towards our Lord, let's be encouraged by Paul's words to the Colossians in chapter 3. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Christ Jesus is Lord of all, and as his disciples, we long for our whole lives to be all for him. Let's sing together. Christ is Lord of all, for us he's given his all, so may all souls long to be all for Jesus. The scriptures tell us that we should confess our sins to our Heavenly Father, who is compassionate and gracious and abounding in love. When we come to him with repentant hearts, we can receive his forgiveness out of his infinite grace and mercy. Please join me in confession now, praying the words in bold with me. Lord Christ, our Maker and our Redeemer, this is your world and we are your people. Come among us and save us. We have willfully misused your gifts of creation. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have seen the ill treatment of others and have not gone to their aid. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have condoned evil and dishonesty and failed to strive for justice. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. 
We have heard the good news of Christ, but have failed to share it with others. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have not loved you with all our heart, nor our neighbours as ourselves. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. The Almighty God, who is Jesus Christ, has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgives us our sins, opens our eyes to God's truth, strengthens us to do God's will, and gives us the joy of his kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. great song to remind us that our hope is in Christ who gives us new life. I have a few notices to share with you this Workplace Sunday. Today we're delighted to welcome Mark Green as our guest speaker. Mark is from the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity. LICC works to empower all God's people to live and share the Word of God wherever we are in our Monday to Saturday lives. Mark was LICC's director for 21 years and is now their mission champion, developing new resources for everyday mission. Do you work local to All Souls Langham Place? All those who work in the area local to All Souls are warmly invited to attend our midweek meetings. We meet fortnightly on Thursdays over lunch. Over scripture, we encourage each other in our work as Christians and we pray together for our work our colleagues and our workplaces. 
Please join us if you work local to All Souls. More details can be found at allsouls.org forward slash workplace. Would you like to discover a more fruitful working life? Then Ergon Fellowship might be for you. Ergon is All Souls' 10-month workplace discipleship course. It's a wonderful opportunity for those in the first third of their working lives to go deeper in their faith with Jesus and grow in understanding God's word. Those who do this course are part of a small learning community that discovers how to be faithful and fruitful in their work. More details can be found at allsouls.org forward slash ergon. Applications for the next academic year are now open and close on the 12th of June. One of the Ergon Fellows, Emily Wong, sat down this week with one of the Ergon trainers, Ross Hendry. Let's take a look at their interview now, and then Emily will lead us in a time of prayer. Well, Emily, thanks for being willing to be interviewed. And uh, just as a first question, really, tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe a bit about what you do and how long you've been coming to All Souls. Hi, Ross. Um, yeah, sure. So I, um, I currently work in this overlap between the pensions industry and the technology industry. So what I do is I create and enhance um, a financial software which allows pension schemes to analyze the financial impact of their decisions before actually making the decision. Um, and I've been working for about four and a half years now. Um, I came to London in 2014 as a student um, and then I joined All Souls in 2015. So I've been part of the All Souls um, student group and now fellowship group and I was in the tech team for a little bit as well. And with all of that involvement in All Souls, what made you apply for the Ergon Fellowship? And uh, was it what you expected it to be when you applied? So I guess prior to joining Ergon, as I was um, you know, starting out work, um, I did feel a slight disconnect between my Christian life and my working life. Um, I had sort of questions such as, how is God um, present at my work? And what should I be aiming to achieve at my work and does it even matter? Um, and I was recommended um, to join Ergon by my fellowship group members um, who had joined it before. And um, it definitely met and exceeded my, my expectations. So it addressed all of these questions um, in a very structured way. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about the, the format. Um, so Ergon stands for about across nine months um, and we meet about once a month for a teaching session uh, which covers the bible story as well as various um, practical topics. We also meet uh, in prayer triplets and each of us are also assigned a mentor who works within the similar industry as us just to chat through um, what we've learned and get it from head knowledge to what it looks like day to day in our different roles. Um, there's also some reading material to get through, um, but I wouldn't let that be daunting at all because even for me, not an avid reader at all, um, it's really just a couple of chapters a month. And I would say it's probably very necessary to put aside some time to reflect on these questions and discover the answers for yourself because it's really fulfilling and uh, it gives a it's something that gives a lot of purpose to you in your work and it's definitely time worth uh, spending. Well, that's amazing to hear that. Thank you so much, Emily. And really, it's an intensive year, but then what happens afterwards? How has it impacted your view and experience of work um, and your faith more generally? I would say Ergon has definitely deepened my faith all around and all aspects of my life because it goes through that big picture story, the, the Bible story, um, the whole of life really now makes a lot more sense to me. And now, for example, I see work as a tool to worship God rather than it being a completely separate part of my life uh, because I know that my work actually matters to him. And besides that, um, through the sharing of the people that I'm with at Ergon, um, it's been so great to see God 
working through not just my industry, but in every other industry and in every other person's day to day. And so that's really just allowed me to see more of God um, every day in life, really, which is, which is amazing. Emily, thank you so much for sharing all of that. And thank you for all that you do serving uh, all of us in church, but also the way that you serve the Lord in your work as well. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. I am now going to say a short series of prayer. Heavenly Father, you have lovingly created each one of us with unique abilities and skills. We are sorry that many times we neglect you and use these for our own selfish gains. Yet we thank you that you still hear our prayer, not because we have done anything deserving, but because of your mercy. This morning, we pray for those around the world who are struggling to meet the financial costs of living, whether this is due to personal circumstances, wars, or inflation. We pray for your providence. Please give wisdom to the world leaders and policy makers that they may use their positional power to help meet this increasing crisis. We also pray for those on the ground that we may be attentive to ways that we can be your loving hands and feet to those struggling financially. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We pray for our mission partner Tim Vickers and his heavy involvement in graduate impact. We thank you for his work to help reason Christian graduates as they transition into work. We pray that you will reveal to them the relevance of their Christian faith in their workplace and that they will bring a desperately needed Christian influence into their workplace culture and make Jesus known. We also pray for your providence and wisdom as Tim and his colleagues look to launch more and more initiatives and projects across the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We pray for the persecuted Christians in Saudi Arabia where Islam is the only religion allowed and conversion to another faith is viewed as a crime, punishable by death. The majority of the Christians are foreigners who temporarily live and work in the country. They can be targeted for their faith and it's another way to abuse a worker in an environment where foreign workers are already often subjected to horrific working and living conditions. In the midst of their suffering, we pray that you give them strength to trust in your bigger plan. We pray that you help encourage each, help them encourage each other that they will not be suffering in vain and that you will use this for your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Finally, Father, we pray, pray for the church family as they engage in work, whether this be paid work, volunteer work, work as they serve family and neighbours, or work as they study. Um, including those retired in their activities. We thank you for the unique position you have placed each of us in. Help us to find joy in using our skills and abilities to serve others and help us to understand more and more what it means to be working for you in whatever we may be doing. Please may your spirit be with us as we go out into the week and guide our thoughts, words and actions so that we may bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every Sunday, we have the wonderful privilege of gathering together as the body of Christ. But Monday to Saturday, we are still the body of Christ and God is very much living and active in our lives, wherever we are and in whatever we do. How are we living as disciples of Jesus? Let's hear now from a few members of the All Souls Church family about how God is at work in his world through their work. Hello, my name is Yuro. My name is Audrey Sue. Hi, I'm Vivian. I work in banking for a Japanese bank doing leverage finance in the city. I'm a doctor working in paediatric neurology, so children with brain, spinal cord and nerve issues. Last year, I was head on to St. John Ambulance as head of legal. to bring my whole self, not just my professional self to work, but my faith as well, and to show it, not just tell it, I commit each day into his care and into his hand, that I will be a blessing to others. You want to get close to your colleagues, 
you want to share their journey, their hopes, their dreams, as well as directing them to your values. There's also the piece around directing your employer and how they should use their resources and their people to be good stewards of God's creation. Whether it is dealing with my patients or my colleagues, being a Christian in a workplace means seeing them as how God sees them, his children who are made in his image, whom he loves and sent his son for. In the post-COVID world, many people are challenging their previous belief systems and values around status and wealth and asking what's it all about. We live in a fallen world. There is suffering, there is illness, and many things that happen that I may not know the reason for. God listens and cares for his people, and I can see how God is using modern medicine and research to continue to restore the original order of things. I look forward to the new heaven and new earth where there will be no more suffering and no need for doctors. When we are gathered together on Sunday and when we are scattered across London throughout the week, we are the body of Christ. We are called to live every day for Him, whether in paid or unpaid roles, in the home or outside the home. In what ways is God at work in your week, using you in His world today? Hello, my name is Charlene and I shall be reading from the book of Acts, chapters 1 to 44. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramitium, about to sail for ports along the coast of province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, 
was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon and Julius in kindness to Paul allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off of the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Canidus. When the, wind, when the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete opposite Salamone. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to our ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbour was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbour in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed the lee of a small island called Cowder, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Seatus. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should, take a, you should, take, you should have taken my advice not to sell from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves the damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you because not one of you will be lost only the ship will be destroyed last night an angel of the god to whom i belong and to whom i serve stood beside me and said do not be afraid paul you must go you must stand trial before treat before caesar and god has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you so keep up your courage men for i have faith in god that it will happen just as he told me nevertheless we must run aground on some island on the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic, the Adriatic Sea. When about, midnight, when about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found that it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay on with this ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes and the, cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them. In front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board when they had eaten as much as they wanted. They lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight became... When daylight came, they did not recognise the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move and the stern was broken into pieces by the pounding surf. 
The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners and prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get on planks or, or on other um, pieces from the ship, of the ship. In this way, everyone reached the land safely. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, shalom, everybody. A joy to be back with you. And on behalf of the whole team at LICC, thank you once again for all your support these many years for our work in empowering all God's people for everyday mission in the places we naturally find ourselves among the people we naturally meet day by day. What indeed has this magnificent passage to teach us about the scope of our mission in our Monday to Saturday workplaces and context? Well, first, a smidgen of personal background and testimony. As some of you know, I used to work in advertising, so you can trust every word you hear from me, and indeed, every picture you see. Actually, I spent 10 years working in advertising in London and New York, and I absolutely loved it. The pace, the creativity, the people, and I adored the lunches. But my testimony is this. I saw God do amazing things in that everyday mission field. Answer prayer on prayer, draw people to himself over time, heal someone on the 10th floor of a Madison Avenue advertising agency in the middle of the day, impact the very work itself, change the heart of a difficult client, guide me through career disappointment, character failure, and romantic catastrophes. And I learned that God can work anywhere through anyone in rich and various ways. And it's a joy, isn't it, to walk with God in our everyday workaday mission fields, wherever we find ourselves. I actually captured some of that learning in a book I wrote called Thank God It's Monday, which my mother regarded as the best book in the world. And uh, my mother was always right. What I wonder is God already doing in and through you in your workplaces or the places you spend your time in the week. What might be the scope of your ministry right where you are? So let's turn to Paul, the great international missionary, on his journey to take the gospel to Rome, Acts 27. It's a rich passage, isn't it? And there are parallels we might explore between Paul and Jonah, two men in boats in a storm, both charged with communicating God's message to the capital city of the dominant empire of their time. And there are parallels too between Paul in a storm on the Mediterranean and the disciples of Jesus in a storm on Lake Galilee. And this passage too is in some ways the climax of the book of Acts, a book that begins with God's promise that the disciples would be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so here we see God's sovereign hand ensuring that all the powers of chaos and darkness that the sea symbolized in biblical thought could not prevent the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ getting to Rome, the very epicenter of the dominant superpower. God will achieve his purposes. And how encouraging that is for us in the United Kingdom, where at least 94 out of every 100 people don't follow Jesus. God will achieve his purposes. But this is also a story, a narrative set in a particular place at a particular time with particular people working out how to respond in their situation, as we all have to every day. And with biblical narratives, the first thing we're meant to do is to look carefully at what's going on in the story itself before we make connections with the wider context of the book or make connections with the Bible as a whole and the revelation of God in the life, death and resurrection of Christ. So here the Holy Spirit, working through Luke, has given us a tremendous amount of detail about this voyage. None of Paul's other journeys on land or sea get a tenth of the space. So what can we learn from this text about the scope of our mission, where we find ourselves day by day? Well, usually in Acts, we see Paul in short encounters with people in the marketplace or speaking on Mars Hill. But imagine for a moment that you are Paul, in a boat, a workplace, with 273 people who don't know Jesus. 
sailors, soldiers, other passengers, for months. Just you and Luke and Aristarchus, three out of 273. That's 1% of the population. Here you are in a minority in a workplace, as many Christians are at work or at school or at uni or at the school gate for a prolonged period of time. So you, you build a good relationship with the centurion Julius who gives you leave to see your friends, verse three. And then one day God gives you a, a message for the senior management team, the centurion, the pilot and the owner of the boat. Now you are by status a prisoner and you are by trade not a sailor but a maker of tents but you are convinced that the decision that the professional sailors have taken will lead to catastrophe. So you speak up and by doing so, you challenge three types of power. The centurion, the power of the state, the pilot, the power of expertise, the senior consultant, if you like, and the owner, the power of money or ownership. And they ignore your advice as often happens in all kinds of contexts. Wisdom from above is not always accepted, is it? Most of us are not in charge. Others make decisions and we can perhaps see that it's not going to turn out well, but we still have to get on with it. Now it's clear that Paul here has been given an insight into the future by God. He's been given a prophecy. And this message comes to Paul in a non-religious context, not in a fellowship group or a church, but out in the world. And notice that Luke doesn't say that Paul used any overtly religious language to communicate it. At this stage, Julius, the pilot, the soldiers, the crew, obviously know that Paul is a follower of the way of Jesus. That's why he's under arrest. But Paul teaches us, doesn't he, that we don't always need to say, God says. And interestingly here, God gives Paul wisdom from above ultimately for the benefit of the whole crew. After all, God does not need a boat to get Paul to Rome. He can whistle up a whale from the Atlantic and dump him on an Italian beach at the mouth of the Tiber. But God is concerned for Paul's companions and God offers information that will limit the commercial impact on the owner. Yes, if the boat stays in port, the ship might go down, but you won't lose the tackle, the cargo, or the people. Well, does God care about the physical and material well-being of the organizations you're in and the people you work with? Well, yes, and it has always been so. This is a spectacular story we have before us, so let me give you a spectacular example. Colin was a production manager in a plastic extrusion molding factory, and there were no orders. The workbenches were silent and the business was in serious danger of going under. So one day, Colin goes down into the molding workshop, takes a chair, sits down by one of the benches, puts his hand on the work surface, and with the workers milling around around him, prayed that the bench would get busy again. And then he did the same thing for the second bench and the third, for all 12 benches in that workshop. That is pretty bold, isn't it? And he did it, not one day, but six days, six working days in a row. And on the seventh day, the factory burned down. No, actually on the seventh day, 72 orders came in. Of course, God doesn't always act in such ways, does he? This is not a prosperity gospel. But throughout the Bible, we see the Lord's concern for our physical environment, our physical and emotional and mental well-being from Eden on. In Eden, God creates a wonderful context for human beings to flourish in. Delicious, nutritious food, running water, a gorgeous environment, a plethora of, of wildlife to enjoy, purposeful work to be done, fellowship with him. Yes, humankind rebel, but God's desire to bless persists. In Genesis 12, God promises that through Abraham, the man of faith, all nations will be blessed. And blessing is never merely understood in spiritual terms. It encompasses every aspect of human life, food, family, friends, work, rest and play. See it in Jeremiah, God commands his people in exile to seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. 
So not only to pray for the peace and prosperity, the shalom of the city of their enemies, but to seek it with all our hearts. So what is shalom? Well, yes, it is wholeness, fulfillment, yes, the spiritual welfare of the city, but also the, the political, physical, mental, emotional, relational, ecological, and economic welfare of the city, or of the town, or of the street, or of the hospital, the office, the building site, the warehouse, the school, the hall you're in, the school gate you go to, the gym you frequent. And of course, work is a big part of making that a reality. But back to Paul. Paul's job is to speak up for the welfare of others, but he does not win the argument. Our job is to speak truth for the benefit of others. You're convinced the policy is wrong, the protocol misguided, the praxis dangerous, the judgment unfair, and it may not change. But speaking out may still be the right thing to do and important for the longer term, as we will see here. And so you set sail and you're Paul. What's the scope of your ministry now that you know that the boat is going down and you and everyone else with it? Well, I wonder what, uh, I wonder what you prayed for your workplaces and your fellow workers back in March 2020 when you could perhaps see the storm coming. Well, Paul's storm comes and it rages for days and the professionals do what they do. They follow best practice, quite right. They throw the cargo overboard, but it's not enough. And everyone despairs for life itself. And what do you do? This business is going down. This business is about to go into liquidation, if you'll excuse the pun. And you're going down with it. So in the midst of this terrible storm, with the boat heaving and the waves crashing and the sun blotted out from the sky and your body being lurched from side to side and your stomach in your cranium, do you have any space in your heart left for anyone else? Pressure often makes us self-focused, doesn't it? But Paul prays for everyone's mortal lives, not just their eternal lives. He intercedes holistically. He encourages them emotionally by telling them that not one of them is going to die. Men, he says, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Now, he doesn't remind them that they ignored his advice before to make them feel guilty, but rather to strengthen their confidence in what he is now saying. I was right before, so you can trust me now. And then he witnesses clearly to them and he tells them the source of his extraordinary confidence. Verse 23, last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul, you must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Notice that the angel tells Paul that God has given him the lives of all who sail with you. It's obvious that Paul has been praying for the people in this workplace, for their physical rescue as well, no doubt, as for their eternal salvation. I wonder if we pray for the people around us. He isn't like Jonah, not bothering to pray for the sailors in his boat. He's not in a, team, in a team in a catering business on the edge of bankruptcy, just praying, God, can I keep my job? He's praying for everyone. Uh, Vicky uh, is a respiratory physiotherapist who in the middle of the pandemic was assigned to an ICU which was overflowing with patients. She was doing 12 hour shifts for weeks. And one day she's standing there in full PPE holding a young man's hand. The oxygen, oxygen blows on full blast and she's silently praying that God would heal him and that God would save his soul. It's not the first time she'd done that and it wouldn't be the last. Not everyone got better and uh, you often didn't know, people got moved. Anyway, a few weeks later, a friend asks her if she treated this particular man. And Vicky says, I'm not at liberty to disclose that information. Well, her friend said, he got better and he's become a Christian. Take Vicky out of the ICU and maybe that young man dies, dies and dies apart from Christ. 
take Paul and his companions off the boat and maybe 273 people die in that storm. Take my friend Richard out of that business and the admin people don't get the salary rise they've been due for years. Valerie is a plumber and he's not just bringing people peace of mind and water that's running in the right places. He's bringing people the peace of Christ. Not so long ago, he turns up at one man's house, a new client, in his usual, usual cheerful mood, but he notices the pain in the man's face. Are you okay? He asks him. And the man replies, I've been diagnosed with lung cancer. Can I pray, says Valerie, because God loves you. And he prays, and he can see peace flow into that stranger's face. Take you out of your workplace, take you out of your front line, and maybe things aren't quite the same. Like Paul, we don't always choose our circumstances, but maybe we can choose whether we consciously, intentionally involve God there. We are stewards entrusted with our workplaces and our everyday front lines. So Paul brings encouragement, but interestingly, he doesn't name Jesus at this point but he does make it clear that his God is the one who is guaranteeing their safety. What's he doing here? Well, he's simply bearing witness of God's action in his life. Does he lay out the whole gospel at this point? Well, apparently not. But might people be intrigued? Might they wonder if this God is real? Might they come to Paul and ask him about it then? Or might they wait to see if they survive, to see if this God's promise is true and then ask? And they do survive. We don't know. Here Paul is bearing witness, sharing what the good news means to him on this day. How did you put up with that bad-tempered boss? Well, my fellowship group prayed for me and her. How did you get that job done on time? Well, I, I, I just asked God to help me because I just knew I couldn't do it. And sometimes people see things, see things in us that we don't. So it was in the middle of... Um, a wave of the pandemic and Vicky, the respiratory physio I mentioned earlier, had been doing 12 hour shifts for weeks, not getting a break, not getting much to eat or drink, swathed in PPE. The noise of the machine so loud that you had to shout to communicate with more than twice as many patients than the ICU ever held before and all of them needing close attention. And of course, some of you know all about this. Relentless, exhausting work. A team meeting, she'd be honest, she'd share about how hard she'd been finding it. But then one day a colleague said to her, oh, Vicky, you're so inspiring. And Vicky was just flabbergasted. She'd actually been in tears pretty much every day, but somehow she'd been inspiring. It's not about putting on a brave face, is it? But there was something about her. And I asked her, what was it? And in a way she didn't know, but she told me that every day before going into her 12, 12 and a half hour shift, She'd prayed, Lord, give me what I need for this. And every day she'd listen to a particular worship song before getting to work. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Some of the words are, the night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Saviour, he will stay. I labour on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. Christ lives in us and shines through weakness, can shine through distress. And God had done something in her that made others see her as an inspiration. The reality is that the more we involve God, the richer our testimony becomes. The more we involve God, the richer our testimony becomes. So Paul encourages emotionally, he witnesses clearly, he strengthens them physically then by encouraging them to eat he says, now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive, verse 34. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. Well, we're meant to care for people's physical well-being. Of course, you know that. But in lots of less pressured situations, that may not be so obvious. The colleague, have you noticed, who hasn't been able to get away from the reception desk for four hours, the beleaguered mum at the school gate, the carer, unseen at home, or the fellow student who perhaps finds themselves with 6,000 words left to write on the influence of Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy on the music of One Direction. 
<laughs> and it has to be emailed to the lecturer by 10 a.m. the following morning. Can I get you a sandwich, a coffee, a cold towel, a Coke, eight gallons of Red Bull? So then Paul does something which to us might seem odd in our politically correct times. He prays in public. He says grace in public, verse 35. Says he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. A while back, my wife was working in a hospital theater and one Sunday she got a strong intimation from God that something bad was going to happen the next day. So we prayed about being ready. And the following morning, the theater teams were all called into the staff room to be informed that a colleague's six-year-old son had fallen out of a first floor window and had died. And that the person who delivered the news said something like, and do pray for her. Now that is a startling enough thing to say in an NHS staff meeting. But then my wife said, let's do it now. And right there and then, she prayed in an NHS staff room with a mixture of Christians and people of other faiths and no faith. At that moment, she took a stand to say that in this unimaginable pain, there is a God who cares and we can share, we can share this with him. No one came up to her afterwards and complained. But Paul is not just giving thanks here, is he? He is actually modeling his faith in God's rescue. He's essentially saying, I am calm enough to eat. I believe it is worth eating because I am not going to die. So I'm going to need my strength. Eating becomes a sign of trust in God. So when he persuades them to eat, when they actually do eat, they're doing something that at some level is a step of faith. I trust enough in Paul's words to eat because maybe I'm not going to die. Paul invites them to live in line with his faith, to believe a little, to look to God, however thin their faith, however vague their grasp of who he is or what this God might do. But there's also something really important about the particular words Luke uses here. These are the same words he uses to describe Jesus breaking bread at the Last Supper and on the Emmaus Road. He took some bread and gave thanks to God, then he broke it. And he took bread, gave thanks to, and broke it and gave it to them. Exactly the same words. Paul is feeding on Christ here. How do we get through? We feed on Christ. And finally, Paul protects them practically. When the crew try to leave, he gives the centurion a piece of advice. Stop the sailors abandoning the ship. And this time the, the centurion does exactly what Paul suggests. So here we've seen Paul under enormous pressure, as indeed some of you are. But even under this life-threatening pressure, Paul doesn't lose sight of the mission he's been called to. Do we, I wonder, have such a big, multifaceted vision for the missional impact that we can make in the boats that we're in, whatever the pressure? Do our children know that they are princes and princesses in the corridors and classrooms of their schools, sent by God to carry the fragrance of Christ and seek his kingdom there? Does the student in the university, the mother at the school gate, the barista in Starbucks, the labor at the port, the executive in an office have such a rich vision, seeking the best for the people they meet and the organizations they're involved with, offering wisdom from above, praying for physical protection, witnessing clearly and taking prayerful, practical initiatives for the physical, emotional, spiritual welfare of all those around them? Is this the kind of vision we're encouraging one another in. Well, Paul was in a boat with a load of people, 275 people. What boat are you in? What are the challenges? What wisdom does God want to bless those people with? What's God doing there? What does he want you to do? And of course, you do not go alone. Acts 27 doesn't just give us a, give us a picture of the scope of our ministry, it gives us a, an insight into the faithfulness of the God who sends us. This God who sends with purpose, who grants favor among non-believers, who gives wisdom from above when wisdom beyond human com computation is needed. This God who communicates whatever the barriers, however dark the day, however terrible the storm. This God who responds in prayer, making clear what he will do 
This God who strengthens his people by word and by his presence. This God who keeps his promise. Not one purpose is lost. This God who fulfills his purposes. The gospel will be heard in Rome as God intended. This is our Lord. The God of Paul and Lydia, Mary and Martha, Colin and Vicky, and by astounding grace, your God and mine, Emmanuel. God with us in our workplaces, in our streets, our homes, our gyms, our classrooms, seeking to work multidimensionally through us for his glory, right where you are and with you all the way. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the boats we're in for the workplaces, the front lines, the everyday context we find ourselves in. Lord, give us your wisdom from above for the very work we do and for the flourishing of our workplaces and front lines. Lord, give us eyes to see each colleague, each person we engage with on our front lines as you see them with generous love and help us indeed to celebrate them to serve them, to strengthen them, and to hold out the word of life to them as you lead. For the blessing of all and the salvation of many, to your glory may it be. Amen. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again.
And so we go out now into the week ahead, knowing we do not go alone. We go with the God who is faithful, the God who sends with purpose, the God who strengthens his people, and the God who listens and responds to prayer. We go knowing it is the Lord Christ we are serving. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.